Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks everyone to um, welcome to the May meeting for our Forest Health Council Committee on Leveraging Resources. Um, Courtney, just in terms of roll call, I can read out who I see. And I believe we do have a quorum. Uh, myself, Amy Moyer, we have Brett Wolk, Christina Burry, Christy Belton, uh, Commissioner Jody Shattuck McNally, who I think may have dropped off for a second, but may come back on. Um, John Ring and Katie McGrath Novak, who we are going to move from a non-voting member to a voting member. So thank you, Katie. Really appreciate just all of your expertise and feedback on this committee. And then we have Aaron Green and Diana Sel Selby here with the Colorado State Forest Service. Did I miss anyone? And welcome back, Angela. It's great to see you. Um, lots to dive into today. So uh, we are going to postpone accepting the meeting minutes for April until June. And then in terms of our agenda today, we are going to spend some time considering a committee action item to recommend to the Forest Health Council at our meeting this week related to um, conversations that we've had um, related to the development of a pre-fire playbook. And we can also talk about a potential language change that we've toyed around with, um, potentially calling it the Forest Resilience Planning Guide and trying to think of what is the most applicable name at this point. Um, but I'll talk through that action item and then we'll have uh, Christina Burry go through um, some of the draft outline that we put together that really combines a lot of the different thought processes thought processes and documents that we talked about last week from the post-fire playbook that's really been a good model for this effort um, and also the risk assessment um, for the decision support efforts in Chafee County to use those um, areas of success as a starting point for this document and then also the stages of readiness um, related to just the Northern Colorado Fireshed Collaborative Charter as three components that we wanted to use as we developed the thought process behind this. Um, any questions or thoughts on the agenda before we dive into things? All right, I am going to try and share my screen and walk through. My Zoom screen is doing some funny things. I wanna make sure I see when people raise their hands. Um, can you all see the my screen and I can zoom into that potential action item? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, and just maybe just jump in. I can't see everyone's faces clearly, so I don't wanna miss if there's a raised hand. So since it's a small group, just feel free to unmute. Um, but I want to talk through first the recommended action item to the Forest Health Council. Um, and this would be an action item that the committee would take today to recommend that the Forest Health Council adopt a recommendation to be included within the 2023 annual report. And we talked last time about um, the timing and sequencing of this potential recommendation so that we didn't lose an opportunity to potentially include this. Um, component in our 2023 recommendation. So I think the timing is nice to walk through this today, potentially talk through the recommendation at the Forest Health Council meeting later this week so that we don't lose an opportunity to include these, these thoughts in the 2023 report. Um, the way I've drafted this action item is that the Forest Health Council would recommend the creation of a forest resilience planning guide to complement or be included as a chapter within the existing post-fire playbook. Um, the planning guide would incorporate the broad expertise and experiences included within the Forest Health Council to achieve the following purpose and goal and be targeted at the following audience. And so I don't need to read through the purpose, goal, and audience. These are the same as we talked about at the last meeting. And then in terms of the work product, um, and Courtney, let me know your thoughts on this, but the way I worded it is that uh, the Forest Health Council would create a detailed outline of the work product with a recommendation that the Department of Natural Resources or the Colorado State Forest Service 
use existing resources or be appropriated funding to finalize the resource product. So I think we've talked about capacity on the Forest Health Council that it would be difficult to come up with a fully formed document, but we wanted to really lean on the expertise that we have in the Forest Health Council to really give it a clear head start and a pretty detailed outline of, of these are the steps that we see could be of value to communities as they try to embark on forest health challenges and lay out their priorities, but also acknowledge that we can't just um, expect DNR and Colorado State Forest Service to potentially pick this up and run with it without either existing um, funding opportunities or to be appropriated some money to work with a contractor or whatever makes sense to get this across the finish line. Um, so Courtney, do you have any immediate thoughts on just the wording of that last piece? And then we can open it up to the group for discussion. I think that wording looks right, Amy. And I think Director McCombs was the most enthusiastic about supporting this. And so I know in the meeting when this comes up, he can chime in too about where he, where he sees State Forest Service resources fitting in here. Okay, great. Thoughts on the action item from the group? Looks good, Amy. I don't, I don't have any, anything to add. Looks great. Thank you for putting that together. I second that. I mean, our, the whole point of this subcommittee is to, to bring things to the full council. And I feel like this is a good, good thing to bring to them. I agree. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Brett, did you want to make a comment? I don't, I don't know if we were all yay or nay. I, I thought it looked good. Okay, I think um, it seems like we can move forward to just our formal um, vote. And I, I think guess we should. I did have one question, and maybe on Courtney with the language. It, says we are gonna, rec as a council, make recommendations, and then we want the DNR or State Forest Service to carry it forward. What's then the, uh, 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 you know, State Forest Service is on the Forest Health Council and represented, but what's the back and forth then, as far as we give them an outline and then it's gone and someone does it and shows us it when it's done, or what's the expectation to check in with the council to make sure that the outline or things are moving forward? I, I don't know what kind of language needs to be in there, what language, how it's currently written as far as the continued back and forth or how strict we want to do and just do it on trust that it'll be sort of developed with us. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and maybe Amy has more thoughts on that. Maybe adding something about like collaboratively developed to to indicate that there might be some back and forth or more like an iterative process. Cause I know that this committee will probably have lots of feedback and, you know, edits. And, you know, when Angela and I wrote the report, at least we would send it out to the council and incorporate edits. And so I imagine something like that, but with more um, edits and more time for feedback. But Amy, what were you thinking? I think that makes sense, Courtney. And I just added a last clause um, and I can share my screen if folks wanna see it, but. Um, to finalize the resource product in collaboration with the Forest Health Council to make that iterative, iterative process clear. And I'm, you know, I guess a question for Angela and Courtney too, is that we would present this action item to the Forest Health Council to hopefully, you know, make this recommendation to them and get buy-in to include this in the 2023 annual report. But I'm guessing we'd have another pass at exactly what the 2023 annual report language would look like as we're finalizing that document as long as it stayed within the bounds of you know what the forest health council agreed to i would say yes and courtney feel free to chime in here um just based off what we did last year with the annual report um we basically yeah created a draft sent that around um you know solicited edits sent out a redlined version and i think we would do the same thing this year But yeah, good point, Brett. And I added, I just added that language. Yeah, I think it looks great. I think that'll help the committee, but also hopefully help the State Forest Service or DNR, whoever ends up doing this to have 
not all fall on them and they can come back to us and have us do some stuff too. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Aaron, did you have, go ahead. Yeah, I would just recommend uh, keeping like the title, like a planning guide. Uh, my comms guy kind of goes like, let me do that part of, of branding and figuring out what to call it um, sometimes. So uh, I would recommend that, um, but otherwise it looks good to me. I think that's fair feedback, Aaron, since we've all gone back and forth at what's the right name for this. And so keeping it generic at this stage would not allow us um, to put ourselves in a box too early on this. Um, so I think we can make, I'm okay making that change and I'm seeing some head nods in the group too. All So I think up for action for this committee is again, the recommendation to the full forest health council um, that I read it earlier with the, the two changes that will reference a planning guide and that will add that the final work product would be done in collaboration with the forest health council. So with those changes, I think we're ready for a vote. Um, so unless there's any final discussion and I'll pause and just raise your hand. If you have any last feedback. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All right, so we will plan to bring this up at our meeting on Thursday. And I'm excited to just get feedback from the Greater Forest Health Council and continue to lay the groundwork for this. Um, I also want to pause and welcome Kate Dunlap. Um, I mentioned she was going to join in my email. She's with the city of Boulder and was really instrumental in developing the post fire playbook. So we had a chance to chat just a bit about what we've been working on on this committee. Um, and I think it really dovetails with some organic conversations that have come Kate's way um, for some logical next steps for the post fire playbook. So I asked Kate if she was willing to join today just to offer some of her lessons learned in developing the post-fire playbook. And I think she'll be a great um, asset just as we move into the next agenda topic um, to look at just some of the outline pieces that Christina put together. But Kate, do you wanna introduce yourself to the group? Yeah, thanks Amy and um, good to see you all. I think I know many of you, but um... It's really neat what you guys are doing and um, appreciate being looped in. Um, I work for the city of Boulder on source water protection projects, which includes a lot of wildfire planning um, and was the lead in developing the Colorado post fire playbook uh, in 2020 and then the update in 2021. So I'm, um, I'll wait for your lead on when you wanna go through that. Yeah, thanks Kate. Um... And Christina, up to you, whether we want Kate to give maybe just some of her overall points yeah. of feedback with the post-fire playbook or whether it's helpful if you wanna walk through just where um, we are with the outline. Let's just do, the, let's just go over high level about the outline. Um, so that way that gives people some frame of reference for Kate's thoughts. Yeah, I think that sounds great. So I'll turn it over to you if that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want me to share my screen or do you want to share your screen with the outline? Do you have it up? I'd have to, I need to pull up, pull yep. up the documents. That'd be awesome. I got it. Just one second. Bear with me, everyone. All right, cool. Um, let me know if there's any tech issues or can't see anything, can't hear me. Um, so the last leveraging resources subcommittee meeting, um, we talked about um, kind of the space that communities can be in where it may not be linear. It could be um, a community could be in a different phase of uh, either collaborative readiness or just in different phases of thinking about project planning and implementation. Um, and so I think it was a, it was 
this kind of came about as almost like a concept outline um, from a few different sources. So one was um, the, uh, the collaborative stages of readiness that um, Katie and, um, and the folks from CFRI talked about uh, in relation to the NOCO fire shed. So I thought that was a good way to kind of like frame and, and pull things together for almost the um, gathering of like who the partners would be if you were a community trying to plan for um, forest health or forest health implementation. Um, so there was, there was that piece, it was the collaborative stages of readiness was one kind of source for this outline. The other was um, Chafee County's uh, keys for success, which were kind of related to the stages of collaborative readiness. Um, and so building on those two things that was shared at the last subcommittee meeting. And then I pulled in uh, the framework from and kind of the outline and format that the post fire playbook used and some of their um, appendices like like funding sources. I thought it was a really good format, easy to follow. Um, so why reinvent the wheel? So I kind of followed that format. And then I also included some of just um, my own kind of watershed planning framework. So um, more adaptive management type, long range scenario type planning um, is what I do at Denver Water. So I pulled in some of that as well. Um, so we have the purpose goal and audience that, that Amy showcased um, and that we already approved at the last meetings. And then I wanted to just throw out um, some forest resilience values. Again, just want to be really clear with you all. This was just a complete concept, like me putting something on paper. I don't have any personal attachment to this. If you guys have feedback, please, please suggest feedback um, or changes, revisions, whatever. Um, I, I won't take it personally. Um, I was just trying to put something down on paper as like an example of what, what this could be. Um, so, wanted to throw out the the values overall and then just thinking about uh the forest health council there's a lot of valuable expertise and input and so i was thinking i was like oh it might be nice to just recognize all the different perspectives we have on the forest health council so again a lot of this is placeholders it's not fully developed so i apologize if i'm missing things but just again it's just for people to get a sense of what what we're thinking um, and so the stages of collaborative readiness for forest resilience, I put these four phases, again, this is more based on kind of my watershed planning framework, but this is just to signify that a community can be in, in, in any of these four phases at any given time, um, it may not just be a linear workflow. Um, so the thought was in the beginning, they gather information, inventory, um, think about uh, the information that's available. And then action plan is coming up with specific actions or projects. Implementation is the implementation of those, those projects and plans. And then from there, evaluating, tracking, and monitoring um, to make sure you're, you're being effective. Um, and so it, this kind of lays out just a little bit more about the different stages and some of the um, some of the steps. And so the post fire playbook had this really awesome stakeholder partner um, contact sheet that you would fill out. Um, each community would be able to fill out, but it had suggestions in there for like water provider, um, municipality, watershed groups. So I took a screenshot of that. Um, so I thought we could do something similar to that for like a contact list. And then um, Katie added in a whole lot of great information about more of the, the groundwork for developing a partnership and kind of collaborating when that doesn't exist. Um, so lots of detail about that, which is great. And then moving on to um, it, within the stage one, there's the assessment, which is thinking through the different tools that exist, like the State Forest Service Wildfire Risk Assessment Tool, the Forest Atlas. I'm sure there's many tools, but this is kind of the place for that. And then from there, prioritization. So working collaboratively to choose priorities. 
Um, and then moving to stage two, the action plan, just talking about creating a portfolio of projects, um, thinking about funding sources, um, and then moving to implementation, um, and then monitoring, tracking, and evaluation. So that's kind of the overall outline. Um, I'll stop there and would love to hear people's thoughts about this concept. I think this is great. Um, I think there's one spot we could be a little bit more robust on, and that's the, and I think you kind of hit on it, was the identify and review values at risk and landscape. So you're talking about geospatial data, critical infrastructure. I think we need links and maybe contacts for people uh, to, to, to get that information from. Yeah. Because if there's someone new to this, I mean, that's that's probably super foreign. I don't know. That that's one spot at least I see. But overall, I, I really like the plan. It's it's I like the fact that you can like the spot where you you copy and paste where you can write down contacts and stuff. I mean, that's super awesome. Um in general, I like it. I, I feel like, you know, like all things, it needs a little bit more thought and a little bit more stuff, but it's a definitely a good a little bit better than a great start, whatever that means. So awesome. That means a lot, John. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Christy. Yeah, this is this is very good. Thanks for the work that you put in. Um, my comments are it helped me a ton to have you walk through it. Um, when I read through it the other day, I had I just it it's kind of there's a lot of um there's a lot of information in here and so um, my comments are, is there a way to make it um, you know, easier for community members to understand it and follow along? I realize this is, you know, like, like John said, a great start, but maybe um, that, that would be my comment is it's, you know, there's just a lot of, God, there's a lot of information just floating around out there. And if there's a way to um, distill it down, that might help. Um, simply because as a regular community member it might be hard for you know somebody to follow along but it's it, it helped a ton for you to go through it thanks christina i, I also think this is a great spot to bring to the council right so this is what you know this is like a draft to the council you know and, and we'll bring in other people to help us make those decisions right the move to push it forward um I hope you know. go ahead Angela thanks Amy um I just had a quick question for Katie uh and apologies if you have talked a lot about this in the few months I was out but um I'm just curious to hear from Katie's perspective uh does this strike you as something that would be useful to the folks that you work with on the collaborative side and or, you know, obviously folks who haven't necessarily gotten collaborative groups together in communities where they want them. Um, and I guess the second part of my question is also, um, like, how, how big of a need do you see for this? Like, are there, because I know there are tons of collaboratives around the state who are, who are doing amazing work and are way far down this they don't necessarily need a guide they kind of have their process in place um so just curious to hear from you like how big you think the need is how many folks out there are sort of casting about you know wondering how to go about putting together a successful program right um so answering your second question first i think there's definitely a need and i think this could definitely help push people that's something that we've been trying to like kind of identify is where exactly that need is because it's like we know where there are groups for the most part but now like where are we missing and why are they missing like why hasn't this started already is it a matter of like resources or interests or what's the reason for that um but i do think there's definitely areas that still have need for this um as far as like the usefulness for people starting, um, obviously I hope that this would be really useful. Um, my main comment that I gave was that like, this is a huge task and the 
four stages of readiness that are listed throughout this. This is like years long process to get to this point. And so one being able to convey with this guide, like, okay, here's like a five page thing, but just so you know, this five pages is going to consume your life for several years. Um, trying to really like convey the magnitude of what like this has the potential to be. Um, and then can we do that without being super overwhelming to people? Great, thanks, that's really helpful. Yeah, thanks, Katie. John, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I've worked with lots of collaboratives over the years and it kind of goes into what, what, what Katie was just talking about is um, we get really good at talking about stuff, but we don't, we aren't very good at about doing stuff. And so this is more of getting that over that hurdle of talking about it and actually doing it. And I think that's that's the piece that's the, the biggest help, I guess. Go ahead, Brett. Um, a week and a half ago, I got an email from a conservation district in um, Westcliff, Custer County. And they said, hey, we saw what you did. How, how do we hire you to do uh, something, do a CWPP? We want to update our CWPP. And my email back to them was, um, here's our JP County report. Here's the NRCS contact, the State Forest Service contact, and the partnership coordinator on your national forest. And I just started filling in. I'm realizing I started filling in these charts and these things on the list. Um, so Angela, there's you know an example that's top of mind, and I have others like that I could share, but that's the most recent. Um, that there are people at a count, you know, the wording was a county or multiple adjacent counties is sort of our target audience. Um, and there's lots of people working at that scale that are trying to figure out, they're seeing things happening. But my worry is how fast we can get it together to help people get there because things are happening pretty fast. And if we take a year or two to do this, there will be less people probably that will be useful for. My other question is a little bit for the State Forest Service folks of what does this, the outline you mentioned comes from the NOCO Fireshed Charter and some of the work we've done. And I've mentioned that in previous calls, a lot of the work we've done, it's really similar, if not the same. And I've learned a lot from the Forest Action Plan and other frameworks that are already out there. We mentioned wildfire radio watersheds. So the State Forest Service already has a Forest Action Plan. How does this help you all when people are coming to request? Just having it be from the Forest Health Council instead of a State Forest Service document, is that helpful? Or are there things in there that are going to help you and me and other people when we get these requests that we don't already have? I see value in it, but I'm I'm curious if you guys have thought about that too, of like, how does this add to when people ask about these resources, the Forest Health Council has those stages that Christina went through of monitoring, planning, you know, I'm forgetting them now, but it's already in there. I guess I'm I'm trying to maybe trying to understand the question a little bit. I think um, it goes back to what we've talked about in the past, which is that, you know, the forest, are you talking, are you talking about like what's on the forest atlas and what's available there and how people get directed there? Yeah, I think, I, I think, you know, to sort of answer my own question, I think this is the forest atlas is one resource that we can point people to. But this would allow us to point them to the wildfire ready watersheds or other resources in addition to that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Brett. I think that, I mean, it's um, it just provides additional resources and it really depends on what people are after specifically, uh, what what they might potentially want to use. And so um, I think that's the part we'll need to be clear about is if you're looking for funding through the Colorado State Forest Service, use this, you know, Forest Atlas as, <laughs> as a resource. Um, so I think, I think that it's, it'll be good to have multiple resources listed. And then I think it'll just um, be, be really critical to make sure it's clear when to use those resources, if they're depending on what the goals are for that community or that uh, county, because 
that's, I think, where people get tripped up and get confused is that there's so many things out there. Um, and you, you do want to potentially use different ones depending on what your goal or what you're after. Um, I didn't see who was first, Katie or John, but go ahead. Um, what John, go ahead. You're for your top on my screen. I actually want to hear what Katie says. Okay, so. perfect. Thanks for, thanks for helping me with the tiebreaker. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, a couple of thoughts that have popped into my head for several of the things that have been said. Um, one is going all the way back to, I think Christy said, um, like kind of the overwhelmingness and guiding people through it. I think some of that could be done just with formatting and like the layout, I think could help people really understand like different graphics could help with that. Um, uh, let's see, I had like three things on my mind. Another thing is as far as like sorting through the resources, I think that'll be definitely the biggest thing with this is like, again, this is a big task. How do we point people to the right resources and how do we help support them in figuring out like which ones to choose over others? And then the, the third thing I was thinking, and I don't know if we could do this through like the funding, like if we were to recommend that the, the State Forest Service or the DNR takes this forward, um, could we take, like, I know there are a couple budding collaboratives that are just being created right now. Um, so could we either go to one of those groups and kind of have them, it's kind of a give and take, right? Like we're giving them this guide, but then also like having them be really involved in helping to create it um, based on their very recent experience. Um, or could we find like a group that hasn't started yet, but like what Brett was talking about where they're like, oh, we want to do this. And then again, we kind of have them be really involved in the building of this. So that was like three disjointed ideas. I like that, Katie. John? Yeah, I think that all ties in. I mean, what Katie's talking about, what Brett's talking about, what Diana's talking about is we want this to be like a place where someone can go and go, I'm at stage A and I need to get to D, or maybe they're at C and they need to get to E. I mean, we want it to, to, to fit all those boxes, but at the same time, try and give them all the information so they can get to where they want to be. You know, I mean, yes, the Forest Atlas might be better at this part and this, you know, layer might be better at that part or whatever, you know, but, but that information will be in this, right? So that they can work through those issues and figure out what's best for them. Um, this is more like the process and not really like the process, how you get from A to B, I think is what we want to try and get to. And then while you're in there, that A to B, all these other things will come into play, right? So I think we need to focus on how we get people involved and give them the information they need. So the, more of the process than, I don't know, that's just what I'm thinking. You know, we want to we want to get them from A to B, to C to D, to E to F. That's the whole thing. And the more information we can give them, the, the better, the more contacts we can get them. Because they can always pick up the phone and call someone at Carl State Forest Service, the BLM or whatever, and be like, hey, I'm struggling with this piece or whatever. And that's, we need to have that information in there, you know, and that's that part about writing down contacts, that's great, you know. Um, I think it all fits together. We're all talking about the same thing, just in a different way. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, like if they really do a good stakeholder identification, like if they have a state forest service contact, that person's gonna show them the forest atlas. So there is like some amount of that. And I think this might be a great time to tee up um, Kate, if you're willing to talk about just some of the feedback you've heard in talking to stakeholders that developed the post-fire playbook um, and some of your lessons learned with everything. Um, because I think, you know, potentially adding sections for each that we've talked about, of you know, tools and support while drawing that line of still making it useful, not overwhelming and understandable. And I you know one of the things 
Kate, that was a real emphasis with the post-fire playbook is trying to remove a lot of jargon, make it understandable for people. Um, and I also know it sounds like you've had some conversations with folks that helped draft the post-fire playbook on a potential need for something along this line as you know, an addendum or next step with the post-fire playbook. So if, if you're up for it, I'd love to turn it over to you just to give some of your thoughts. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I really appreciate being able to see that outline that looks really great and a lot of work went into that, I can tell. Um, we have, so um, Eric Schroeder from US Forest Service, um, he and I have kind of talked about whether or not we should reopen the post-fire playbook um, because there have been a lot of resources that have been developed since we finished the most recent draft in um, 2021. Um, like the wildfire ready watersheds, for example. Um, but I will say just some lessons learned from that and things that we've heard that have been very helpful from those who have used the Colorado post fire playbook. Um, the, the first thing is that we've received a lot of positive response about how every step in that playbook is is critical. And it's also implementable regardless of your resources. So if you're coming from La Jara, Colorado or Boulder, Colorado, you can do every one of those steps um, and should. And it is called the post-fire playbook, even though it is 11 steps before, during, and the first 30 days after a fire. Um, so maybe the name isn't the best, but um, so I think just sticking with those critical steps we did try to make it um, as usable as possible, but if I were to do it, if we do reopen it, I would um, do a plain language review because there's, it's, while the target audience is not residents, it was really like city or county staff or tribes or water providers. I think there's definitely a need to make things more simplified in some areas, in some of those terms that are used um it also helps to have that logical order um like steps one through 11 i mean it's three sections so it's like 1.1 1. 1. 1 to 1. 1.4 and then 2.1 to 2.3 um one recommendation i would have for for you guys as you guys work through this document um well there's something new is it really helped us as a group um, because we were all volunteers working on that project is that every meeting we had, we really divvied up responsibilities so that it really reduced the burden on any given, on any one person. Um, so one person would reach out to five different agencies and then another would reach out to a different five agencies and get their feedback. Um, so if you're not already doing that, that would be one recommendation. It also um, makes everybody feel a part of the process too and ensures that you're touching base with all the critical agencies that need to have input. Um, and I think from, from, from the outline, I, I think one thing to think about is how much of your document would be an overlap with the playbook. If it seems like a significant portion of the document is an overlap, would it make more sense to incorporate it? Um, if there is an overlapping audience and goal, um, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about is as you get that the, in the Colorado Post Fire Playbook, the final section is on funding, um, some of which is still relevant, some of it's not really relevant anymore. And there's a lot more options for funding than, than were available before. So, one thought I've been having is root scrapping that and just doing a resources or sort of this appendix of if you have the resources, the staffing and or the time, then do these things like forest health projects, um, model, using modeling to understand your risks, which a lot of counties or municipalities may not have the resource to do. But if they do, um, it might be nice to have that in, as a post fire as part of the playbook to just kind of like that first section of this is a critical and everybody should be able to do it in the next section of and if you have more time and resources, you should also do this. Which I think would touch more on what you guys are putting together. 
but so the, those are just some initial thoughts I have, but I don't know if you guys had any questions or anything about that. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so I, th I feel like uh, when we were talking about pre-fire, post-fire, I mean, the, I feel like the mechanisms are pretty close to the same when we're trying to implement projects, right? So, I mean, there might be different avenues for money and stuff like that, but in general, we're trying to implement projects and those pathways tend to be pretty close, um, at least what I've seen. And then there was another thing that came up that Kate was talking about, and I think it was kind of where, where Brett was going, is kind of roles and responsibilities with this document. like updating it right or maintenance on the document i mean who's going to be responsible for that so that that's another thing that would be nice to get flushed out and hopefully someone will take responsibility for that i don't know what that looks like but so yeah, I, it does I, help to have a contact on there yeah i, I feel like there, 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 there might be more overlap than we think with these two documents just because it's the we're, it's the nature of the the beast kind of deal yeah and that um the accessibility piece is something else to consider as well because we we really were we're trying we spent a lot of time trying to figure out where should this document be housed and ultimately it's housed on cphe's website and we've tried to encourage everyone to only link on their own websites to cdphe and not upload the actual PDF in case there are updates. So that would be um, something that you guys would consider as well if you guys do a, a separate document. No, Brett. Ahead, Brett. Um, thanks, Kate. Uh, great to have your experience on this. I have a comment, I appreciate what you said about the funding, and then I have a, a question for you. Um, I was actually looking the, um, what is it, the purpose that we have right now for our, uh, whatever we're calling it, Forest Resilience Planning Guide, um, says the last part, be competitive at receiving funding to achieve effective forest health management and resiliency. And I wonder if that's, actually our goal, or if it's the first part of the sentence of better leverage resources and resources sort of captures knowledge as well as funding. And I want to make it explicit, but just thinking about if we're trying to make everyone competitive, then we're actually feeding competition amongst all the people. And I think what we want to do as a council is lift everyone up so that everyone is sharing resources in the right way. So I might think about rewording that and then like John said earlier, we're trying to lay out a process for people. Um, and I think that speaks to what you were saying, Kate, of rather than a list of here's these static funding sources, which are always changing, here's the process that you go through. And at each stage, there's different kinds of funding for the kinds of activities you might be mm -hmm. trying to, to achieve. So that's kind of an observation, but um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned sort of making it accessible and had different people use it. Who has been one of the biggest users that wasn't someone you intended and originally designed it for? Because I think this has kind of gone crazy. And like, so who's using it that wasn't, you never intended for it to be used? I think, well, I haven't heard of anybody using it that it wasn't intended for. So I've only heard, um, I or other people who worked on it um, have only been in conversations with um, municipalities and counties who have used it to date. Um, and municipalities, some of which double as water providers. So um, I'm trying to think if anybody, I'm not sure if I've heard of someone else using it like an agency or something, but. I can jump in real quick and just say that I've used it um, to understand the post-fire landscape. So oh, after the commercial fire, um, I was tapped to uh, work with CWCB and our U.S. Forest Service partners to um, to do a post fire burn assessment. You know, to determine, do some hydrological modeling, determine if we needed to do anything more extensive. Um, and the state doesn't have, you know, a bare process, uh, you know, that we can stand up if a fire is on non federal land. So 
we were sort of pulling things together. And anyway, so I, I used it to understand the whole process because I'm totally new to it. And um, so just from a like process perspective as an agent, you know, agency staff, I found it incredibly useful. Oh, good. That's good to hear. Other questions for Kate? Any thoughts on, um, you know, I don't think this is a decision we have to make today, but whether it's a standalone document or incorporated as part of a post, the post fire playbook. Well, there's a little thought like well, there, there should be some uh, connection, right? But so if we call it forest resilient, whatever, whatever, is there that connection to it? Is it really a pre-fire? I, I don't know. what, But I, I feel like there is some connection between these two documents, but, and I don't know if it's just the name will make it that way or if we incorporate stuff in there. I think that's still to, to, to be determined, but I feel like there's got to be something, right? Like some tentacle that connects the two. Um, and maybe there, maybe really there doesn't need to be. I mean, we were doing pre-fire work and then there's a fire and then we do this one. Maybe there isn't a connection. I don't know. I mean, that needs to be, I think it's more about knowing that the other one's out there. So if you're doing one, you knowing that the other one's there or, you know, back and forth. And I don't know how, what, what that connection is, but. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're definitely linked. Um, it almost seems, because your document is really trying to set um, municipalities or counties up to um, understand where their high risks are and start implementing forest health projects and get grants, right? That's, that was sort of my takeaway. Um, so, they should, it seems like they, the documents should refer to each other if they end up being separate documents, um, for sure. I think one thing that you would really want to do in your document is making it very clear who, why your document is different than other um, documents, because there's so many, as you guys know, there's so many reports or um, websites or resources out there, it's really hard to differentiate them and know which one you should be using from a municipality or county perspective. Um, so if you guys can really make it that clear and how it differs from the like the wildfire ready watersheds, because it seems like there's also some overlap with that as well. I mean, it can also be, you know, just reach out to me if, this, if you guys talk and you guys think that um, in the end they should just reference each other or be incorporated in some way. Um, I, we can definitely have that conversation and I can um, loop in the, the group that originally developed the post fire playbook and we'd be happy to talk through that. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Go ahead, Christina. Yeah, just Kate, thank you so much for your time and perspective and just really value your opinion on everything. So thank you. <laughs> um, so I think where it lives, like, is it a part of the post fire playbook or is it separate? I, I do think that it would be good to get Matt McCombs and, and Dan's perspective on that. The reason being the post fire playbook is housed at CDPHE, who's not really part of the council. So they may have strong feelings about it. I, I don't know. Do I, I don't feel strongly, however, whether it would be like a part, like an appendix or like kind of a standalone chapter as part of the post-fire playbook. I don't feel strongly. I, I think um, where we can be efficient and include it, cool. Um, if, if it, you know, is better served as a standalone document that needs to be attributed to kind of the state forest service DNR and the forest health council, then I do think referencing the post fire playbook is, is really important. Um, because a lot of the, the value is kind of like the contact sheet, which is very similar. Um, so yeah. And yeah. And I think the, we've, we've had conversations about kind of the the similarities with wildfire ready watersheds. And I, I 
do think as, as this planning guide um, is being uh, put forth, I, I think there will need to be some conversations, many with, you know, CWCB and, and how we can avoid confusion for communities that are going through that process. But all that to say, I think there's, there is a lot of overlap and complexity with the existing processes and documents. I do think this one is a little bit different. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Kate. I, um, I want to leave just a few minutes for us at the end to wrap up how we'll approach the Forest Health Council this week. Um, so John, why don't you go ahead and then I'll, I'll begin to wrap us up. Yeah, real quick. So I, I mean, just looking at the two documents, you know, one is we got to think about objectives, right? So one is to try and prevent or mitigate the effects of fire. And the other one is we've had a fire. Now, what do we do? So just putting that out there. And I just want to echo um, Christina's thanks to you, Kate. I really appreciate just the thought that you put in and being willing to, to talk with us today. It's been hugely helpful and massive thanks to Christina Burry for taking the lead on getting this outline together because I think it just really pushes us forward and helps crystallize our thinking. So that was a big undertaking um, to combine just lots of thought over the last few months and, and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, as we think about the meeting on Thursday, I think you know I'm happy to tee up the, the action item that we talked through today, it does seem like it would be helpful and really help to this group, Christina, to have you walk through the outline if you're up for it, just to yep. give a picture and help people visualize what we're talking about. So I think we can do that on Thursday and I think we should have enough time. Um, Courtney, I can't remember how much time we have on the agenda, but this will be our, I think, main focus. I will be virtual, unfortunately. I was supposed to be in person, but I had a couple of things come up, so. Yeah. yeah, no problem. And I think we should be able to screen share, right, Courtney and Angela, so we can show, we can have Christina do a similar walkthrough. Yes, we can, we can definitely set that up. Okay. We, have, we have 15 minutes on the agenda for updates and motions from the com both committees. Okay. And Courtney and Angela, do we need to make or tee up a motion for the Forest Health Council to adopt this recommendation? Or are we just at this point saying, you know, we've made a recommendation to the full council and we'll consider it when we vote for the 2023 annual report process? I just can't remember how that sequencing goes. That's a good question. Um, I guess my thoughts around it are that, um, and Courtney, again, walk me back if I've missed context here over the last couple months. If Does this committee sort of have an okay from the full council to move forward with this project? Because I do sort of feel like if they approve this resolution at this council meeting, that it that is sort of the permission to go forth and, and do this project. And I, I do think that check-in point is important um, in case there are any members of the council who feel strongly that this is not the best use of a committee's time. Um, and then I would imagine in the annual report, we would have some little sort of not only this, but then um, a little summary of what's been done so far. Courtney, does that sound right? Yeah, I think that sounds right. The council has not been briefed on this project yet. The committee's really been building, I mean, so much to share. And so I think this is, yeah, that check-in moment. And I think, yeah, there should be, um, I think it makes sense. And I think that's what you were saying, Amy, uh, like a motion and then the council would vote to support this. And then it kind of can just be moving forward throughout the rest of the year. Okay. The committee. So so it sounds like we would maybe want a motion on Thursday to move forward with this endeavor, or is that one step too quickly? No, I think that's, I think that's correct. Okay. Um, and I have to, I might have to go back and reread the statement to think about like the structure of the motions, but. Okay. Um, 
but we could talk about that a bit behind the scenes before the meeting or like at lunch or, or during the meeting or whatever. That sounds good. And we'll just try and be mindful. Christina and I have time to make sure we give um, kind of an adequate summary and collect feedback because we've only, you're right, we've only mentioned this at the Forest Health Council pretty high level that we've been sort of discussing this approach, but we've made several leaps, I think, since the last time we've given an update. So getting their feedback on a number of things is, is definitely at the point um, that we're at. Okay, well, Angela and Courtney, I can work with you a little bit on just teeing up the right motion. And Christy and I can make sure you're looped in just so we can go through the outline. Um, I can try and pull together just a summary of all of the great feedback um, we collected today and work with you, Christina, just to make sure you have it. And then I think next meeting, we can talk about just a plan for next steps with this process, assuming that we get the buy-in from the full Forest Health Council. And then we might consider um, at the next meeting talking about how to go back to our discussion on how to support um, conversations around Colorado's all lands forest activity database. And we had talked at one point about potentially having Utah's um, WRI team give a presentation on their process. And I think it was New Mexico's vegetation management um, database as well. So we can figure out how to potentially come up with a plan to keep this recommendation moving and look at some of the other parking lot items that we've put on hold. So all good progress. All right, and I think that wraps us up for today. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, again, thanks to Kate and thanks to Christina for all the work behind the scenes. And I think we'll see many of you later this week. All right, bye everyone. Thank you.